Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I know people are slowly coming in and try to maybe sit. So if you maybe leave some rooms or chairs for others as they come, that would be great. And also now, actually, the worship this morning was amazing. Yes. We had such a wonderful, amazing worship service to reflect the voice of Tamar. Mm. Wow, two Tamars we saw today. And uh, her subversive uh, action against the institution this morning. And uh, I almost like uh, cried. Mm. Yes, I'm dead. I am dead Tamar. Mm. <laughs> so from the stories of Tamar to the stories of our own, Women have struggled and fought with institutions. However, we know that women are not just victims of this struggle. Women, we are the agency of a transforma uh, transformational changes of our history despite patriarchal oppression and colonial violence. So today we want to hear from our speakers how institutions have shaped our history and at the same time how women have challenged and changed the institutions within and beyond our time and space. So I would like to introduce our great speakers now. And the first speaker will be Reverend Kenethia Bingham Thai. She is the Chief Connectional Ministries Officer of the Connectional Table, and she came to the Connectional Table as a board member in 2012. She provided leadership on the Connectional Table Executive Committee, served as the chair of the writing team that shaped the legislation on human sexuality and worked on issues related to the worldwide nature of the church. In her current role as a Chief Connectional Ministries Officer, uh, Kenethia uh, helps lead the Connectional Table in the collaborative work of discerning and articulating the vision and stewarding the mission and ministries and resources of the worldwide United Methodist Church. Before came, uh, coming to the Connectional Table in a step role, Dr. Uh, the Reverend Bingham Thai served on the Michigan Annual Conference Cabinet as a chief missional uh, strategist. There she shepherded the ministry of some 60 plus churches in central Michigan. She has served on the annual conference leadership team, the conference board of church and society, the board of ordained ministry, and the annual conference trustees. She was a delegate to the general and jurisdiction conferences in 2012 and 2016. In 2012, she chaired a general conference legislative subco uh, subcommittee on reproductive rights. Ordained in 2009, she has pastored all uh, local churches in Lansing and Kalamazoo, Michigan. She is a member of Black Clergy of Michigan, Sacred Sisters, and of Black Methodist for Church Renewal. She is a soak after speaker who has a passion for the growth and vitality of the United Methodist Church and for equality and justice for all. She is married to Keith Dye. Together they have two children, Keaton and Kendam. Is that the right pronunciation? <laughs> Thank you. And I have also, I want to introduce our also second guest speaker today, Dean Virginia Sapiro. Is an internationally recognized expert on women and politics. She came to Boston University in 2007 to become Dean of the College of Art and Sciences. Before that, she was the Sophonieba P. Breckenridge Professor of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she was on the faculty for 30 one years, and in her later years there, served as a both vice provost for teaching and learning, and as an interim provost and vice con uh, chancellor for academic affairs. Very big, big name there. In 2015, after eight years of serving as a dean at BU, she stepped back from that position to resume teaching and research as a professor of political science. A member of American Academy of Art and Science since 2002, her most recent publication is the recently published article, Sexual Harassment, 
colon, performances of gender, sexuality, and power. Her current research subject focuses on a history of higher education in the U.S., emphasizing the relationship of this history to the development of nation, state, and society since the 17th century. Dr. Sapiro is also active in community service through her involvement in the board nonprofit organizations, including both Shelter Music Boston, which presents eight or 90 annual, annual chamber music concerts in Greater Boston homeless shelters and recover centers, recovery centers, delivering live classic music as a social service, and also Gilmanton's own, aimed at uh, supporting farmers artists and artisans in a rural New Hampshire community. So please welcome our two great speakers today. <laughs> and now our first guest speaker is Reverend Kenneth Abingham Thai. Thank you. And I am going to attach this mic here somehow. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Well, I am very grateful uh, to be here to share this time with all of you, uh, to share the time with uh, Dr. Sapiro uh, and with the organizers of this, this event, and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm wondering who I'm speaking to. Uh, how many of you are theology students or are studying here? All right. How many of you are already in pastoral ministry? Oh, quite a number, quite a number. How many of you are staff? Interested parties, just who kind of wandered into the halls of the Divinity School here and the School of Theology and found yourself wondering, what's going on down there in the basement? All right, all right. Well, I was given this topic, the princess and the trickster, women in institutions, and um, I'm gonna share a little bit about myself, a little bit about my perspectives, uh, but I'm going to begin with a poem because I love poetry and I am going to end with the same poem and reflect on it a bit uh, as, it, as it relates to women in leadership within institutions. This is a poem by Alice Walker. It is in her collection called Horses Make a Landscape Look More Beautiful and it, the poem is entitled Remember. Remember me? I am the girl with the dark skin, whose shoes are thin. I am the girl with rotted teeth. I am the dark, rotten tooth girl with the wounded eye and the melted ear. I am the girl holding their babies, cooking their meals, sweeping their yards, washing their clothes, dark and rotting and wounded, wounded. I would give to the human race only hope. I am the woman with a blessed dark skin. I am the woman with the teeth repaired. I am the woman with the healing eye, the ear that hears. I am the woman, dark, repaired, healed, listening to you. I would give to the human race only hope. Hope. I am the woman offering two flowers whose roots are twin, justice and hope. Let us begin. The Princess and the Trickster. I am a second career clergy person in the United Methodist Church. In 2006, I was commissioned into ministry and received my first pastoral appointment as an associate pastor of a large university church. I was ordained, as that wonderful uh, bio mentioned, in 2009, and served for a short while as the sole pastor of that church, where I had begun as an associate. I left there in 2011 to serve as pastor of an inner, inner city church of about 60 families. In my annual conference, I was only the second African-American woman ever ordained an elder. 
At my first pastoral appointment, I was only the second African-American person ever to be appointed there as pastor. In my next appointment, I was the first woman and the first African-American ever appointed as pastor of that church. In 2013, I became the superintendent of a district where I had supervision of 60 plus churches and their pastors. I found myself supervising pastors who were older than me and had been in ministry longer than I had. I found myself also as the first female superintendent in the history of that district and the first African American superintendent in its history. I am no longer superintendent of that district. I am now, as you have heard, the Chief Connectional Ministries Officer of the Connectional Table of the United Methodist Church. The Connectional Table is the body that discerns and articulates the vision and stewards the mission ministries and resources of our worldwide denomination. We do that in collaboration with our Council of Bishops and with others. Our current work, as you have heard, involves focusing our denomination missionally in ways that will improve the vitality of local churches. Our work also involves exploring ways in which we can become a more equitable worldwide connection. We also help to steward the resources of the denomination by determining the allocations of our quadrennial budget. As a woman, leading in these kinds of institutional spaces and within the context of the intersections of race and gender, I lead differently than men and differently than some of the dominant culture. As a woman of color, I lead with a particular set of values and with a different sensibility than many within the institutional spaces that I occupy. In particular, I lead in ways that are relational. In my leadership, I am aware of and sensitive to the exercise and misuse of power, which is often expressed in a relational dynamic. I also understand institutions as systems and am particularly keen to the influence of systemic racism, sexism, and homophobia on our institutions. I care deeply about issues of justice and inclusion and understand my call to be, to resist all forms of evil and, and oppression in whatever forms they may present themselves. I know I am not alone in that because that is part of the United Methodist membership vow. More broadly, however, I seek in my ministry and in my life to restore beloved community. Because of who I am, and because of God's call upon my life, I naturally lead in ways that seek to subvert systems of oppression and that lead to reconciliation and justice. The differences that I bring to leadership are often applauded and rewarded. However, they are also sometimes resented and experienced as threatening. I believe that the reason my leadership is sometimes experienced as threatening is because it is fundamentally subversive of the powers of oppression that are part of the systems in which I operate. I do not and cannot, as a usual practice, operate within established institutional norms that oppress without contributing to my own oppression and to the oppression of others. My own growth as a leader has been to become okay with the backlash I sometimes experience and with the sacrifice that leading sometimes outside established institutional norms involves. Indeed, I view that sacrifice as part of a higher calling because as a person of Christian faith, I seek to model my life and my leadership on the example of Jesus, whose call is expressed in that well-known passage of the Gospel of Luke. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let 
the oppressed go free. In the short time that I have to share with you today, I am going to address the topic of the princess and the trickster, women in institutions, by offering a brief overview of a couple of biblical narratives that I hope will get at the questions that were raised in the description of this event. In particular, these questions were raised. Should we engage from the margins? striving to subvert or flip dynamics of power and privilege. The narrative that I will use to get at this question will come from the book of Judges. It is the story of Deborah, Israel's judge and leader, and Jael the Kenite, Israel's trickster. I will highlight ways in which Deborah leads from the center by using institutional power and authority, and the ways in which Jael leads from the margins by subverting systems of oppression and power within institutional and political space. You also, or the framers of this conversation, also ask the question, should we transcend negative experiences trusting that if we sufficiently perform and conform, our institutions will protect us? The narrative that I will use to get at this question will come from the book of Esther. It is the story of Vashti, a deposed and prophetic queen, and Esther, the new queen of the court, and a woman who becomes court strategist. In this case, I will highlight the interplay between prophetic resistance and strategic conformity, the ways in which Vashti resists and Esther as princess performs, then uses but subverts conformity to institutional norms that, that oppress. In both of these cases, I hope to raise questions about how women lead to mediate oppression in institutional space. Again, I hope to raise questions. I don't really intend to provide you with any answers, except for one, which I'm gonna do right now. It is the second question that is uh, uh, implicit in the second part of that second question, where you ask, should we transcend negative experiences trusting that if we sufficiently perform and conform, our institutional institutions will protect us? The question I glean from this is, will our institutions protect us? Mm. This is my one answer for you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Our institutions ordinarily will not protect us. Institutions ordinarily protect themselves. Mm -hmm. They protect existing power structures mm -hmm. and the systemic isms that are embedded in them. Mm -hmm. However, there are certain cases where it is important that we protect our institutions or act as prophetic witnesses within them. And um, that I think get to a little bit when we do the um, the workshop. So let's begin with the story of Deborah and Jael as recounted in the book of Judges. You all know this story, but I'm going to uh, tell, tell it to you again. Deborah was both judge, prophet, and commander of the Israelite army. As judge, she held court under the palm of Deborah, no less, and decided disputes among the people. As prophet, she was the people's visionary. As commander, she led Israel's army, engaged in war on behalf of Israel's God and on behalf of Israel's people. Deborah worked within the context of institutional space, the institutional space of a government structure, of a judiciary, and of a military. In the story presented to us in Judges in chapter four in particular, the context is oppression and war. Israel has been sold into the hands of Jabin, king of the Canaanites. They have been harshly oppressed by the Canaanites for 20 years. And now they are at war against an army with superior armaments. The Canaanite commander, Sisera, has armaments of iron and has instilled in them fear. Deborah orders one of her generals, Barak, to go to battle against Sisera. The text notes 
She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak, however, hedges in response to Deborah's order. He insists that he will do what she asks, but only if she goes with him. Barak says to her, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Perhaps Barak wants Deborah present to cover for him if he fails. Perhaps he is afraid to take the lead in battle. We don't know why Barak hesitates, but we do have a record of Deborah's response. Certainly, I will go with you, she says, but because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. Deborah's statement suggests that Sisera will fall at the hand of Deborah, the only woman to whom we have been introduced at this point in the story. But it turns out that it is not Deborah who prevails over Sisera. It is a little known woman, a marginalized woman, without power, privilege, or position who engages Israel's adversary. It is Jael, the Kenite, who leads from the margins in this story. Indeed, after being rooted in battle with Israel, Sisera escapes and goes to Jael's tent to hide. He goes to her tent because the Canaanites had an alliance with the tribe of Jael's husband. Sisera expects Jael's allegiance based on the allegiance of her husband. He expects that she, as the wife of Heber, the Kenite, will honor the allegiances of her husband's tribe. He also expects her hospitality based on the cultural norms of the time. Jael occupies both political and institutional space in the story. She occupies political space in terms of tribal alliances. She occupies institutional spaces of marriage and family. Jael invites Sisera into her tent and into these spaces. But she then plays the trickster and subverts his expectations and the expectations of the political and institutional spaces which they both occupy. She lulls Sisera into sleep and into a false sense of security. And forgive the violence of the scene, while Sisera is sleeping, Jael kills him. Jael, the trister, subverts the expectation of hospitality and allegiance to an oppressor. She plays the trickster and subverts the dynamic of power. Deborah had predicted that Sisera would fall at the hands of a woman, and he is killed by Jael, a woman from the margins, who thus brings ultimate victory to Israel. Let's go back to Deborah. As Jael leads from the margins, Deborah leads from the center of institutional power. She is the commander, the judge, and Israel's visionary prophet. She controls institutional space, sets the parameters for what is and is not allowed. She is not afraid of her own power, position, and authority within the institutional and political spaces she occupies. She never apologizes for her own power. But she also does not seek to accumulate power and position as an end in and of themselves. And she does not use power to oppress. To the contrary, Deborah uses power and position from the institutional center to battle oppression and to care for and provide an ordered life for her community. Both Jael and Deborah are examples of women's leadership within institutional space from both the center and from the margins. They are examples of confident, unapologetic, strategic leadership working on the one hand within established power structures and according to established norms, and on the other hand from the margins of established power structures while subverting established norms. 
Whichever ways these women work, whichever models they employ, they work toward the same end, to flip and to subvert systems of oppression. Now, we have to and must interrogate this text for its elevation of war and violence as a way of dealing with oppression. We must interrogate this text and it's suggested that an oppressor must be destroyed. Cicero was still a human being. There were many ways in which Cicero was indeed vulnerable in the story. We must ask, was there any possibility of the redemption of Cicero? Was there any room for mercy? What are the implications of subverting expectations of hospitality and exploiting a person's false sense of security, even for a just cause? What are the implications for human suffering and for the degradation of the environment of using war as a means to fight oppression? We should interrogate the text around all of these issues, yet we should also learn from it. We should learn from these two examples of women leading from the center and margin and either using or subverting power and oppression. Let's take one more story. Let's look at the biblical story in the book of Esther of Vashti and Esther. I know you know this story as well. Vashti was the queen of Xerxes' court, but she was really no more than the king's consort. She was expected to be at his beck and call, to be paraded before his guests like one of his royal objects. Note the text. For a full 180 days, King Xerxes displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all of the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. Wine was served in goblets of gold. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restriction, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown, in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Queen Vashti lives within institutional space that is predicated on oppressive male power. Yet she does not conform to the demands of that oppressive institutional space, and she refuses to be objectified by toxic male power. Because of this, she is cast out. Note the text again. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. According to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes. King Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the people of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then, when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. Hmm. These wise men advised the king that Queen Vashti should be banished because she was a threat. Her refusal to conform and obey is dangerous to the maintenance of institutional male power. 
The clear message is that nonconformity leads to punishment. Queen Vashti is punished by being disposed and cast out of the court. Is Vashti's resistance ineffective? Is her further marginalization proof that resistance does not work? Certainly, her marginalization is proof that resistance is often dangerous. However, her resistance has power. Otherwise, the men would not be so threatened by her resistance and would not have needed to make of her an example. Indeed, their response points to the prophetic witness and power of her resistance. Her willingness to resist her own oppression and to do so publicly has the power and potential to awaken the resistance of other women. It certainly awakens and sets up Esther's resistance. Indeed, after Vashti's expulsion, the king needs another queen. He collects a harem of beautiful virgins from around the kingdom and brings them to the court. After presumably sleeping with a number of them, he chooses Esther, the adopted daughter of the Jew Mordecai. Note the text again. Esther was taken to King Xerxes in the rural residence in the 10th month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Of course, the oppression that Vashti has experienced within that institutional space is not limited to just Vashti or to women in general. It extends to Esther and to a whole people. The same king who cavalierly summons his wife to be viewed as an object of the court, the same king who then casts her out, the same king who considers in his right to collect a harem of virgins, such a man can also cavalierly sanction ethnic cleansing. The story tells us that one of, kings, of the king's generals, Haman, had become angry with Mordecai the Jew because Mordecai would not pay him proper homage. For revenge, Haman sought the king's permission to exterminate all of the Jews, and King Xerxes grants that permission. Listen to the text describe Haman's plot. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, there's a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people. They do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators, administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agonite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. Hmm. Here, toxic and oppressive institutional power comes into the play at the intersections of gender and religion, culture, and ethnicity. The same power that subjugates women seeks to exterminate a whole people based on their ethnicity, religion, and culture. This toxic institutional power is directed at power as an end in and of itself. It is oppressive and destructive by its very nature, regardless of its target. The two women in this story deal with this abusive institutional power in different ways. Vashti resists oppression and becomes an archetype of prophetic witness and martyr. And in doing that, she creates space for other women and for Esther, who will take the fight against oppression to its completion in the story. Indeed, Esther comes into the story as one who performs and conforms as a way of subverting oppression. Mordecai has come to Esther to appeal to her to intervene. She knows that to intervene, she must initiate contact with the king, which is forbidden and punishable by death. She does so eventually, even though by doing so, she risks death. Hear the text again. 
Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death, unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you come to your rural position for such a time as this. Esther heard that plea. And she goes back before the king and appeals on behalf of the Jews. Her political capital is exceptional performance and her previous conformity within that institutional space. You remember the references to her being more pleasing to the king. By conforming and performing well herself, she is able to subvert that conformity to institutional norms that oppress. Of course, this text also cannot be sanitized of its violence. Esther ultimately prevails, not only by ending the edict to exterminate the Jews, but also by engineering the execution of Haman. Again, we have to interrogate such texts. Do we deal with oppression through violence, or are there more redemptive ways? Even as we ask such questions, we can still learn from these texts. These are all stories of women who sought to address oppression and deal with how power is used within institutional, political, and societal spaces. Vashti operated as prophetic witness to resist oppressive power. Esther operated as strategist to perform and conform to subvert oppression. Jael and Deborah operated from the margins and from the center, respectively, to use authority and power or to subvert abusive power in order to deal with oppression. These women lived and worked within institutional and political spaces that were marked by oppression from within and from without. Most women, in particular women of marginalized communities, are likewise operating within institutional and political spaces that are marked by oppression from within and from without. I believe that the biblical stories and others that you could probably name, including the story of Tamar, challenge us as women to not fear our own exercise of power especially when we seek to manage institutional spaces to curb or mediate oppression. We must not be afraid to exercise power and authority. We also must understand the institutional and political spaces in which we live and work to understand when and how to conform and perform well within the rules of those institutional spaces. Conforming and performing can build political capital. In addition, we must, as women, sometimes be as strategic as the trickster who subverts institutional power structures to further the cause of justice and to survive. And we must sometimes be prophetic witnesses, challenging oppressive power structures within institutions even when it means that we will pay a price. Now, as I come to an end, I want to return back to that point and read it to you again. Remember, by Alice Walker. Remember me? I am the girl with the dark skin whose shoes are thin. I am the girl with rotted teeth. I am the dark, rotten teeth girl with a wounded eye and the melted ear. 
I am the girl holding their babies, cooking their meals, sweeping their yards, washing their clothes, dark and rotting and wounded. Wounded. I would give to the human race only hope. I am the woman with a blessed dark skin. I am the woman with teeth repaired. I am the woman with a healing eye, the ear that hears. I am the woman, dark, repaired, healed, listening to you. I would give to the human race only hope. I am the woman offering two flowers whose roots are twin, justice and hope. Let us begin. This poem first imagines an oppressed black girl. She is oppressed by racism, by sexism, and by the abuse of those systemic sins. This girl with rotted teeth, melted ear, and wounded eye operates within institutional and societal spaces marked by racial and economic exploitation and oppression. But this girl, subjugated as dark servant and slave, becomes woman with blessed dark skin. She becomes leader with teeth repaired, with healing eye and ear that hears. She becomes Deborah, Jael, Esther, Vashti, women leaders, conforming, performing, resisting, commanding, fighting, subverting, abusive systems of institutional power and oppression. She offers to the world and to us justice and hope whose flowers are twin. There's our twin flowers because hope for the redemption of our institutional spaces rests in justice. These are twin flowers because the call for women leaders within institutional spaces is to bring hope by being vehicles of justice as leading women and men within a variety of institutions. Let us begin to bring justice and hope to our institutions and to the world. Thank you. Before we go to the actually next uh, guest speaker, is there any like urgent questions that you wanna ask? Okay, then we will actually uh, go to the next guest speaker. That was here. How is our room temperature here? Too cold? Yeah. Okay, I will try to do something. Thank you. I now regret. Saying I'd go second. <laughs> yeah, that was wonderful. Um, I love the stories in particular. Before before I get going, um, my main connection, only real connection with the ministry in which so many of you are or intend to be, is that at one point I thought I would become a rabbi. <laughs> Had I done so, I would have been the second woman in the history of the world to be a rabbi. And that was too big a, how should I put it, burden to bear. So uh, I didn't do that, but, but those stories you told, and especially the story of Esther, some of you may know that the Jewish festival of Purim is just passed, which uh, celebrates that story, yet another everyday tale of ethnic cleansing against Jews. Um, and I remember once when I was a kid, it is a great festival. You kids dress up in costumes, and it's sort of our version of Halloween or something. You act out the various parts, and you talk about the liberation. And I remember being very proud of the Esther costume that my mother sewed for me. Um, but asking my rabbi whether Vashti was actually bad. Um, this would have been the early 1960s. And I said, "Is what did Vashti do that was wrong when she refused to go dance, which is how we were told the story. And he said, you know, I was never sure of that. And I was very pleased with that answer. 
Um, and it actually hooked in with a number of other things that were going on at exactly the same time, because that happened that same rabbi was one of the rabbis who traveled to St. Augustine with Dr. King, um, which was an amazing event in my childhood to miss him on a Sabbath service because he was in jail. <clears throat> and so everything's connected, everything's connected. Um, so, so I want to take some of these same questions and turn them on us um, and ask, and tell some stories also, some historical stories, but tell some stories that ask some hard questions about those of us who decide to resist and those of us who have, believe we have higher ideals and fight the system from the inside or the outside and some of the dangers we face. I'll talk a little bit about patriarchal institutions and those difficulties, but I want us to interrogate ourselves about what we're doing when we have our higher ideals and act on those. So the title of my talk I chose um, is Subordination and Power in Institutions Defined by Higher Ideals. We'll focus on those higher ideals. How many of us have had occasion to be shocked and disappointed by an organization or social institution to which we've devoted our time and energy because we found its leadership or its practices violated the very mission that moved us to become involved in the first place. How many of us have found our faith in an organization or a social institution in which we have placed great trust shattered because we found that its leadership or practices contradicted those very ideals that had earned our faith and our trust. How many of us have found ourselves undergoing a process reminiscent of grieving when we experience that shock, disappointment, or shattering of admiration and faith? And in those circumstances, how many of us have felt a growing reluctance to trust, a cynicism, a bitterness, or an anger that spreads and begins to affect other social connections. We discover churches in which priests or ministers systematically abuse children or women, academies in which teachers systematically abuse their students or more junior colleagues, and they have a self-protection racket to cover up that abuse. We discover that women who have chosen to serve in the defense of their country have to undergo abuse by their officers or suffer even harsher consequences. We discover that trainers and doctors associated with athletic organizations dedicated to bringing out the best in children, aspiring to excel, have been abusing those children. We discover that portions of our government, its leaders and citizens, in a country long attached to the ideals of democracy, representation, and justice, are advocates of making it difficult for people to participate in the basic institutions of governance. They prefer policies that favor company profits over protecting our environment, and they advocate separating babies and children from their parents. Why don't the higher ideals enshrined in these institutions, core documents, and in the claims of their leaders and advocates, protect these institutions from abusing the most vulnerable people in their midst? And how should we think about engaging in these institutions, especially as leaders who both honor their core missions and apparent ideals? How do we juggle commitment to the institutions and to changing them? How do we do that when we who are women and are members of other subordinated groups have to juggle both our own victimization and complicity? That is a long stream of questions, <laughs> for sure. During the workshop phase of today, I am simply going to reread those questions and open it for whoever's present. That's, that's how I understand the workshop. And so we'll go wherever people in the room want to go with those. But what I want to do in the next 20 minutes or so is to offer up some notes and directions on dealing with these questions. These notes come from two sources. 
One is my scholarly expertise. I'm a political scientist, and therefore I've spent my career systematically trying to understand people in power and authority laden institutions in the context of democracy. My own specialty in political is political psychology, the ways that people perceive, think, and feel, and act in politics and political circumstances in the context of social institutions and long-standing conventions of social relationships. In particular, I spent most of my career studying gender and politics, and most recently focusing on sexual and gender harassment. The second source of my notes is my experience in leadership positions, largely in universities and professional organizations. I spent a couple of decades now being a woman in leadership positions in historically male-dominated institutions, in which I have purposefully and conscientiously tried to be a change agent, while at the same time honoring those institutions I sought to change. A lot of my perceptions during that time have been shaped by these understandings I have gained as a research scholar in my field while trying to enact change from the inside. Maybe Deborah, but that would be a little arrogant. <laughs> I enjoy weaving together those different sources of knowledge, the scholarly and the scientific with the experiential. So let me work through a few observations on this problem of subordination and power in institutions defined by higher ideals. Most nonprofit organizations frame themselves uh, in what I'm calling higher ideals. Consider the definition of a nonprofit. These are institutions that may own property and have various forms of income, but that allow them to engage in activities and perform services that are done for reasons other than making a profit. That is, bringing in more revenue that assures the activities can continue. Our churches, synagogues, mosques, most schools, hospitals, social service organizations, all of these have higher ideals than making profits they heal people, save people, educate them, take care of them, and make the world a better place in some way while still needed to function as organizations and still needing revenue. Likewise, a government in a democracy, take this one, founded with a constitution that was designed to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And we know some of the stories of what happened. 